see the end of it next year. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. No, next year is my just very, yeah, yeah, not very clear. It's very slow. Hi. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so we have a laptop over here, so hopefully, yeah, maybe I will sit over here like, so we can all be included um, <laughs> in the video if possible. Yeah, we can, we can move up if you want. Oh, that's fine. Uh, mm, it's okay. I will just sit over here. Okay, so um, okay, so let's get started uh, for today. And I emailed um, and also uploaded things on Moodle. Um, so this class mostly is trying to give you the introduction of a different type of one parameter model. Okay, in particular, I want to get this in uh, because in homework two you will see those kind of examples over and over again. Sometimes it's more like asking for your understanding. Sometimes it's more about, okay, how about you gonna code it up and then do some analysis? So I want to get the chance um, so everybody is familiar with what the context is. So, so far what we have done is the one parameter model for beta binomial. And it's a conjugate prior. Beta is a conjugate prior for the binomial because you see that you start with beta you combine with the binomial likelihood and you arrive at another beta, okay? So in this case, the Poisson model over here is gamma Poisson gamma, okay? So it's again conjugate, and what that is doing is you start with a gamma prior for the rate parameter theta, and you combine with the Poisson distribution, and you're gonna come to a gamma posterior in the end. Okay, so actually, um, this is pretty much very much based on um, the textbook section 3.2, the Poisson model, but I wrote it up in a way that, okay, we break it down into steps, and then let's just try to use this as an exercise, like step by step to make sure that, okay, you are able to derive what it is, and I think depends on how much we want to do, we can either just look at the proportional, like just try to recognize the kernel, say, forget about the normalizing constant, I just want to derive what it is. Because over here, I told you that, okay, uh, gamma is conjugate for Poisson. So even if I don't care about the uh, normalizing constant, I will arrive at a different gamma. So that's the like, technique that we used before. But if we get extra time, we can also just try to keep the normalizing constant, do more of the calculus over there, most, mostly about integration. And then you can arrive at the same conclusion as well. Okay, so let me, um, yeah, just maybe just to start. So Poisson distribution, last time we talked about it a little bit, is mostly for doing um, modeling counts, okay? So I, I, yeah, so on the first bullet point over here, that gives you the Poisson density, okay? So um, theta is the only parameter over here. Theta raised to the power of y times exponent negative theta divided by y factorial, okay? And because it's count, and counts can start from zero, so you get 0, 1, 2, 3, 2, infinity, all the integers. Mm -hmm. And um, something very special about this Poisson distribution is the mean and the variance are the same, okay? And they're both the rate, okay? Okay, so uh, if you want to model count, and I know if you want to do, say, using the model, uh, using the Poisson distribution to model the counts, and then you only have theta, the rate parameter, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So wait, so what exactly does theta stand for in the Poisson? Mm -hmm, yeah, right, right. I was about to say, so uh, yeah, theta over here is, I think people like to say as a rate parameter, like rate of occurrences. Okay, yeah, you can, yeah, you can, I guess that would be a way to understand it. Uh, good, okay, so then with this one parameter, we're gonna, if we try to do um, Bayesian inference, we will put a prior distribution for theta, which is the rate. And a very common uh, choice is gamma distribution. So I put it down in the second bullet point over here. Uh, looks a little bit um, involved, but again, if you just read it carefully, you will notice that, and not surprisingly, that if you think about all of the terms related to theta, it's very similar, right? Again, it's very similar to the Poisson distribution, like the parts related to theta. So this, again, will give you a hint that like why this two actually conjugate. Okay, so uh, let's break it down step by step. So over here, uh, the Poisson distribution. Mm -hmm. Liza, anything? Uh, you're, 
She's muted. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, you know, I meant to say I didn't mean for that to go to everyone. That was to Julia. I thought I was just talking to Julia. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Oh, sorry, no. my bad. <laughs> oh, don't worry. Okay. But you guys hear us okay, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. I realize maybe this is kind of too small. So maybe, um, oh, I can zoom in. Okay. Great. Okay. Yeah, I didn't know that. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So for the gamma distribution, um, you see that now the gamma distribution is on the parameter theta, which is rate, okay? And there are two hyperparameters for gamma, it's A and B, okay? So the PDF is kind of involved. So again, this is constant, B raised to the power of A and gamma A. So gamma function A, last time we talked about it, if it's um, A, if, if A is integer, then it's A minus one factorial, okay? But a lot of times you actually don't have to worry too much about it if it's conjugate case. And in the kernel, you see that is theta raised to the power of a minus y, one, and exponent negative b times theta, okay? So um, you can go back, if you want, you can go back actually to try with a different a, just like with the beta case, you can try with different an a and b to see what a gamma distribution look like, especially if you change um, different, um, yeah, different a's and b's. But overall, uh, pay attention that this is the PDF, and then uh, mean and variance is given, and sometimes we we'll like to talk about the mode as well. But mostly, I think at the moment, especially for today, let's mostly take it as a, like an exercise, since now you're given the density of gamma. If, you, if I tell you now, okay, with gamma prior, you combine with the Poisson likelihood, you can actually come to another gamma, which will be the conjugate case. So for today, let's focus on how we can make sure that we understand the derivation because that can get you prepared for doing the homework at least, but also just um, get you exposed to a different type of one parameter model out there. Any questions? In mm -hmm. R, mm -hmm. is A gonna be the shape of the mm. rate and the rate? I okay, the yes, good point. Okay, so I don't remember the, <laughs> I could, yeah, okay, good point. So Becky's question is actually, so gamma, yeah, so gamma, there are two ways to parameterize it. I forgot exactly but how the, yeah, so we should, okay, so I will give, okay, good point. So I think I will definitely provide um, like some, some write up out there to make sure that, okay, so the problem is gamma distribution has two, two different parameterizations in, I mean, in anything, you can write it and in R they have different parameterizations as well. So right now uh, in derivation, we're using this A and B in this particular way. Okay, so it's, exactly b raised to the power of a divided by gamma a and et cetera, et cetera. But there is a different way that you parameterize it. I think it's about like b divided by theta, something like that. But don't worry about it now. Like what we're gonna use is what we have for today. Uh, but in terms of using R, there's some subtle like nuance over there, which I will address um, after this lecture, okay? All right, good point. So definitely you have some experience coding that, which is good. All right, so uh, we're just gonna move on based on what you have, the Poisson likelihood, and then the gamma prior. And I would like to ask you, based on what you have on the document, like point one, um, uh, like uh, bullet point one and point two, I would like to ask you to try number three, uh, meaning that you write out the prior gamma AB, you complete the join PDF of the data. So over here, uh, each of the YI is Poisson. Okay, so this is what this is about. So each of the YI is Poisson theta, okay? And here, we're looking at Y1 to YN because you might observe multiple um, observation. Okay, so if you assume that they're IID, then you can just simply multiply all of their density together. Okay, so I would say for this step, write out the like each of the like write out write out the one for YI, and then just write the product in front of it. And then the last one will be uh, the exercise that is very similar to derive um, the beta binomial case. Okay, so let's just pause here for a while. I think. Um, yeah, like doing it together in Yale would definitely be useful. At the moment, since it's probably the first time everybody is seeing this, I think it would be nice if you take the time and do it step by step. And that's also brush up your skills um, for 
algebra and calculus over here. Well, is it though? Because isn't y different in each part of the sum? Isn't it oh, smaller? sorry, sorry, no. Or I just no. left it. Yeah. Mm, it is different. Good yeah. point. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like a factorial. Factorial. Well, that's not the right way to say it, but there's I a lot of stuff multiplied together. You definitely need it. It's yeah, because you cannot plot at them because yeah. it's each factorial step on. Uh, you can do it, but in our case, we don't have to. Yeah, yeah. Okay, no, good point. Okay, so maybe let me, okay, so the first one, I guess, for the prior is just pretty much just copy it down, right? Okay, cool, okay. And uh, right now, we're leaving the constant over here uh, because we're doing equation. And later, we're gonna show either you think about it in terms of proportional or just try to keep the constant and try to derive it. You can arrive at the same conclusion. All right, so prior is this. And what about the likelihood? So let's do it maybe one by one. So earlier we know that each of the yi given theta will be a Poisson. So each of this will be, so don't forget, this is theta raised to the power of yi. Okay, so I think that's how uh, sometimes uh, things get complicated. But in the exponent, it's always the same, right? And then down here, don't forget, is yi factorial, right? So if you try to write, so now this is for one yi, but if you want to do it for, oh, for the product, ooh, for the product of the yi, you will have to, because first of all, we assume that y1, y2, yn given theta, their iid, identically dis, uh, in, independently identically distributed as the Poisson, and that's how you can do it, okay, for some theta. So because they're iid, the joint of all of the yi will just be the product of the marginal, okay? So let me just write it out step by step. So i from one to n, and I just write what I had earlier on the right-hand side. Right? And then in order to, I guess earlier, like the question was how I can simplify this, especially putting, putting the uh, product sign into all of the terms so I can come up with something simpler, I guess. So the thing you can do over here will be, okay, so on the top, it's a bunch of theta raised to the power of yi product together, right? So maybe let me just leave the term over there for now. We can, we can, yeah, yeah, but I just want to, <laughs> yeah, yeah, leave it for there for a little bit. And then it's product, because I want to show it step by step, and each step is doing the same simplification, okay? And down here will be product of yi factorial, right? So in the bottom, I guess we should just leave it over there, yeah, because there's no, I mean, you can write it out, but it's okay, kind of tedious. No way to get yeah, I think so, yeah. However, everybody can still see, right? Okay, yeah, so we keep the bottom, but on the top, what do you think? What do you think of this first term? How can we further simplify this? So is each yi just i? I'm, I'm a little confused it's about gonna be, what yi is. So each yi is a different observation mm -hmm. data. So it seems like theta to y1 times theta to y2. So, oh, so okay. it's going to be theta to the sum of the yi. Yes, okay, right. Okay, let me just slow this down a little bit. Okay, so we're writing over here. So this is where we're aiming at right now. And the thing is, because it's always theta raised to some power, and the change, i from 1 to 
n is on the power. So if you're producting all of the terms, it becomes theta raised to the sum of all of those terms. So if you want to like just break it down, just to make sure that, okay, I can convince myself that is the case. If you want, you can try to write it this way, right? And then that would just be theta of y to the power of y1 plus y2 plus until yn, which is theta raised to sum of yi, i from one to n. Okay, all right, so this is um, the first simplification that we can do. Okay, and you notice that we want to do this because later when you try to combine with a prior, you want to keep things like in the power of theta so you can combine things. Grant, did you have a question? Mm -hmm. yeah, no, I'll, I'll wait for a second. Oh, okay, cool. And the second one, what about the second one? Yeah, we'll just be moving it into the exponent, okay? Yeah, so it's exponent negative theta, you're doing n copies of it, so that will just be negative n theta, okay? And notice that, I mean, you can, you can live it there, like even just stop here, that's fine, it's, no, it's not wrong. And um, the good practice of doing it early, like just to simplify in this way, just like I was describing earlier, if you look at the density for the gamma, you know that eventually we're gonna combine this two, right? When we're trying to do post, uh, posterior, trying to derive the posterior, and you see that it's in the form of theta raised to some power, and in the exponent, this is bad writing, sorry, I should correct that, uh, uh, exponent something, and it's negative something of theta, okay? And you see that if we simplify in this way, they are just gonna like make your life a little bit easier later, okay? All right, so cool. So I guess um, both of these are good. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's just take, and everybody else remotely also good? Okay, yeah, just like, yeah, like mm -hmm. unmute yourself whenever you want to talk and, and now I just want to stop a little bit, like pause for a while, so you can make sure that you can get um, the posterior, right? And I would say maybe the first time, don't worry about the normalizing constant. Like, yeah, just do the proportional for now. Make sure that you, um, uh, let me write proportional for now, and later we can do um, the actual derivation. Do the proportional, meaning that ignoring constants. And here, when we're talking about constants, it's not just like A, B, whatever, or like one, two, three. It's constant com like in terms of theta, because theta is what we try to make inference about. So anything is not related to theta, it's gonna be constant. Okay, so try that, and uh, we're gonna pause for a little bit. If you think you have come to the answer, you can check with that particular bullet point over there because I actually wrote it down what the two parameters should be so you can verify if that is the case. If not, maybe go back to check what went wrong. And I think that kind of self-checking might be more helpful than just looking at the results directly.
You guys getting it? Okay. Mm -hmm. And Becky as yeah. well? How about Cheryl, Julia, and Lisa? I got it. Okay, cool. Okay, <laughs> all right. So let's just look at it um, together. I think should be uh, straightforward, but still, it would be nice to see it done um, at least once, okay? So here, we're doing the normalizing constant, ignoring it, right? So you can just start doing proportional. And what you can do, so what is normalizing constant over here? This is, so he, we're talking about normalizing constant or constant in this case is because you're talking about posterior of theta. Theta is the thing that you're interested in. So anything not related to theta is, normal, is constant. So in the prior, this will be the constant, right? So I only need to keep the part with theta. And uh, in the likelihood, the sum of the yi in the power, and then divided by something that we were saying that it's hard to further simplify. So this, again, is about the data, nothing about theta. So you can ignore that as well. So this gets you And you see that it's two pairs of things, right? One pair is about theta. So here is theta raised to the power of a plus the sum of yi minus one, okay? And in the exponent, it's the sum of n and b times theta and negative, okay? And this, again, is the exercise of recognizing the kernel, right? We know that because in this case, we were told at the beginning that this is a conjugate case. So I would know, okay, this is gonna be a gamma. And what will be my hyperprior? It will be this and this, right? So I can write, okay, theta given y1 to yn is again a gamma with the first hyperparameter a plus the sum of yi. And the second one will just be b plus n. Okay, cool. All right, so this is uh, number three and then number four, just summarizing all of this. So let me go through this before we actually um, get the chance to derive it more formally. Okay, so no, part four over here, I just want to write, yeah, the gamma distribution is conjugate prior for the Poisson sampling model. So again, sampling model, data model, we use those terms interchangeably. And you come up with a gamma like this. And notice that here, Remember in the beta binomial case, I did something similar. I was trying to show that, okay, the posterior mean is the weighted average of the prior mean and the sample mean. And in this case, so I think in a lot of uh, the conjugate case, you can actually show it. That can, is easy to see. So over here, um, this will be the prior, uh, posterior mean. That's just by using uh, the mean for a gamma. And you can further break it down into this. So this is, prior mean, right? And this is sample mean. And again, the weight is being controlled by A, B. Uh, most, oh, in this case, actually just B and N, right? Because the first weight is B over B plus N. Second weight is N over B plus N. So N is fixed, actually, because that's the only data that you get. So you can see that you can control. Okay, so if I have a prior belief and I have very strong belief, I think that is true, I will actually increase B to represent that I have a very strong belief over there, okay? And um, right, okay, so there's that. And also down here, number five, I just wrote it down. If you're interested in looking at prediction of this particular conjugate model, I just don't want to write like a very long uh, document for this. I want to keep it one page. And um, for prediction, if you're curious, you can also go to the textbook to see how they derive it. But it's very similar to what we have done with the beta binomial case. So remember yesterday in class, we did the prediction um, and then I think we saw it to be a binomial again, Bernoulli in particular, because you're getting the success probability. So a prediction, if you want that particular exercise, go for it, totally feel free. Uh, it's just one thing is later, once we start doing all of the computation, you will notice that, oh, a lot of times. So first of all, a lot of times you cannot 
derive the prediction distribution. We might not come up to anything sensible anyway. So there's one thing. For those conjugate cases, easy. But for many others, it's not. So there's one thing. And also, once we learn more about those computation methods, prediction can be done more easily. You don't even need to derive it. You can already get it from the posterior distribution of the parameter. OK? So that's why um, I only want to show it once for the beta binomial case yesterday. And if you're curious about this, feel free to go to the textbook, uh, and you can get some really good exercise, I think, doing that derivation. All right, so now let me bring up a whiteboard. And let's whiteboard, OK, here. And, oh, no, no, no whiteboard okay this is good all right so i'm just gonna start giving you what we know okay so this part of the exercise is without ignoring the normalizing constant what can you do okay so this is the prior likelihood i will write it for you over here and you can start doing it. I think many of you already have the notes for yourself, so you can start doing it. I just want to write on the whiteboard over here. And this might take a little bit, but don't feel frustrated. It's not easy task, and um, it's good exercise. I have a question. Oh yeah, go ahead. Oh yeah, yeah. So what exactly is YI again? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so why, okay. Why, we know that Y given theta is a Poisson. Okay, yeah. so each of the y will be a count. You're modeling the count. So yi is the count of the six, or it's just whatever the count is in the i trial. Or? You can understand that way. So maybe, okay, maybe let's, okay, what, what count makes sense? Maybe I'm standing in front of like a plaza and I'm trying to count how many people are passing by in each of the five minutes, say. Okay. And then I count. Yeah, my Y1 will be the first five minutes. I count, I don't know, 10. And then Y2 will be the second five minutes. And then that's the count. Yeah. So over here, right. So, um, okay. So let me address that maybe at the end, because I think this is a really good question. And I think I went too fast at the beginning. Uh, but for now, maybe let's focus on how to derive it. And at the end, I can, yeah, I, I, will, I would like to do that, actually. Okay, so try this. And... Um, I will just write the useful hint on the right hand side because this again is very similar to what we have seen with the beta. Okay, so if you have P theta to be a gamma and it's integrated to one, so you can actually get rid of theta in certain cases. Oh, for us, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but also for the recording as well. Then oh, they yes. can, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, sorry, but we know you're there.
first step is I'm mean, not like explaining to what the end just want to like make sure that everybody is on the same page um, so first of all because we're keeping all of the constant we're just using the base rule and down there a base theorem and down in the bottom um, it's gonna be uh, integral because this is a continuous distribution okay so you have on the top is the product of the prior and the likelihood in the bottom is the same product but you're integrating over theta okay so I will just keep writing and um, you can check you can talk uh, I guess in this case it's hard to talk because um, everybody is uh, like just one person at one place but um, um, okay I will just keep writing this so the key here is that you never put anything into proportional sign The second step I did over here is really just replacing all of the terms. Um, and um, the next step is try to recognize what terms can be canceled, right? Okay, so. So I would try to move everything that's not related to theta at all to the front. So what would I have will be Nope. Then I have theta a plus some um, y minus one. I'm putting all of this constants in from because those wouldn't affect how I'm gonna do the integration, right? Because the integral is only in terms of theta. So, and then outside the integral, those two are the same, so they got canceled, okay? So I guess um, the next step is maybe like the hardest one. Um, and but you see the trick right it's nothing like it's nothing very different from the beta case so what are we going to do with this mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> what do you think mm -hmm. uh, so you're going to multiply in your constant that you need to integrate to one for gamma and then just multiply Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay, so let me just write it on the right, just formally once. So because we are curious about how to get this. And what we know is this is very much, it is the kernel of a particular gamma, right? And the particular gamma, if we're going to guess, will be gamma a plus sum of y and m plus b, right? So in order to get the entire PDF, the normalizing constant for the gamma, what we have, because um, whatever over here, we know that for gamma a, b, this will be the constant, right? So for gamma a plus sum of y and the m plus b, this will actually be gamma, so the new a, over the new b to the power of new a, right? Okay, so if you do that, and that's in the bottom, so then you get reversed again, okay? So you get it reversed, that will just be the new b on the top, a uh, new b to the power of new a on the top, and then the gamma function in the bottom, and then exactly 
the kernel that you want. And that is the entire PDF of the gamma. And that convinces you that this is a gamma distribution. Okay, so let me just finish writing the last step. So this gives me theta. Gamma. And this completes the derivation. Okay, so once again, um, I think um, for most of the cases, we won't do any of this, especially later, it's very hard. Um, but hopefully, um, all of you can be convinced at the moment, at least, that for the conjugate case, it's safe just to throw away the normalizing constant. You're guaranteed to arrive at. And you see that looking in terms of proportion or not just the keeping every constant, they give you the same results. So we will feel comfortable just do that. Yes? You said for the conjugate case, it's OK to throw away the constant. Mm -hmm. Why would it, what, it, even if it's not conjugate, wouldn't it still be OK or not? Right, good point. So later, but uh, OK, so right now, we're trying to derive the entire posterior, right? Like say we only have, so in this case, good question. So we only have one parameter when you try to get this particular one, right? It's theta, and I'm deriving the posterior for theta. So once we move away from one parameter model, things start to get complicated. Say for the normal case, if you want to make inference both for the mean and the variance, you have two variables, right? You have two parameters. What are you gonna do, right? So over there, we're gonna, so the goal will be, okay, if I can derive a posterior of the joint, I'm fine, right? However, it will be hard to do that, and later you will see that the particular um, computation methods that we're gonna learn called Gibbs sampler is trying to say for the mu and sigma case, sigma square case for the normal case, I will actually derive mu given data and sigma square, and then sigma square given mu and data. So it's not like, a, like it's, not a, it's not a posterior in the sense that we understand right now. It's slightly different. So let me maybe bring that up. Good question. So Grant's question is, for a non-conjugate case, the normalizing constant wouldn't matter either, right? And I agree. It's just right now I try not to say it because it's still different from what we're actually going to do later. So the example that I want to talk about just briefly is normal mu sigma square. If this is unknown, both of this unknown, I'm gonna end up with two parameters, like two hyperparameters, like two parameters, and what I'm gonna do if data follows this, okay? So later, when we learn the sampling methods called Gibbs sampler, so first of all, if you want to do Bayesian inference for two parameters, the goal is still try to get the posterior, but now you have two parameters, so we are trying to get the joint posterior but a lot of times it's hard to do. And the Gibbs sampler is trying to do the following. So I, if I can come up with what this distribution is, so notice this is not the posterior. This is different, right? If it's posterior, it's only given the data, but now I have two parameters. So if I can come up with this, and if I can also come up with sigma square given mu and all of the data, if I know these two distributions, and there's certain theory guarantee that all of this, if you round the sampler long enough, gonna approximate the joint posterior, then I'm good to go. Okay, so we're gonna get into detail later, of course, but just to answer the question um, right now, later we're trying to derive things not called posterior anymore, called full conditional, okay? Full meaning that if I'm only looking at one parameter, I'm conditioning everything else, including the data and any other parameter that I can think of. So we don't call this posterior anymore. And those will be the full conditionals. And if we can recognize the kernel over there, which is what Gibbs sampler can do, you can approximate the joint posterior. Okay, so this is like just a heads up, what we're gonna do. And um, the reason why I don't want to, say, so later if you, yeah, once we get there, you will realize, okay, to derive the full conditional, everything is constant. We don't even care over there either. Um, but again, it's still slightly different from what we're doing right now. So um, yeah, so once we get there, I think you will see a fuller picture.
Okay, sounds good. And I guess before we end, just one more thing, because earlier Grant also asked the question of what is YI for a Poisson case. So maybe let me just come up with something. Um, okay, so Y1 to YN, right? And we're saying that given theta, each of this is going to follow a Poisson with the rate theta. Okay, so I guess back then in beta binomial case, we actually talked about whether you can use a beta, a, a binomial model for the data, right? Like at that time, we talked about the four conditions that you have to satisfy if you do a binomial model. So for the Poisson, especially if it's written in this way, what do you think it's making, like what assumptions do you think it's making over here? I think this is actually a good exercise. And I'm glad that Grant asked the question. So yeah, if it's written in this way, given the rate parameter, it's the same rate parameter. Y1 to Yn, it's Iid plus on with parameter rate or rate parameter theta. What do you think it's making the assumption? Is theta between zero and one? Not anymore. Oh, it's not. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So sorry. So okay. Right. So that's another thing. Okay. So theta um, is the rate parameter of a Poisson, and it can be anything, it's, as long as larger than zero. Sorry, I should have noted that earlier. Yeah. yeah, okay, so theta needs to be larger than one, uh, larger than zero, that's the only, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, so that's the thing, so in, so if you learn, like if you took like probability class, they're gonna use lambda over there, because that's what's commonly used uh, for um, the rate parameter, and then for beta, people like to use P, uh, not beta, sorry, uh, the binomial. People just use P because that's the success probability. Here, we start just to use everything with theta just to show that, okay, theta right now is one parameter, so I only have one theta, right? But later for the mu, uh, for, for normal, sometimes people actually like to write this. Say, I still use theta to represent all of my parameters. It's two, it's two parameters over there. So yeah, get, start to get used to maybe just looking at and using theta to represent all kinds of models. So I guess, good question, because if you're not familiar with the Poisson, then because we're using theta for bino a binomial and theta again, it's, it's a little bit confusing, I agree. So it's the rate parameter for the Poisson, and um, theta is larger than zero. Okay, all right. So what are the assumptions over here? What do you think? ID is one thing. I mean, are you talking about a specific case? Of mm, okay, right. So maybe, okay, maybe let's just use the example that I was trying to say earlier. Say like, okay, I'm trying to count a uh, number of people in uh, interval of five minutes. Okay, I'm standing at the same place. I'm just gonna count how many people. And let's just do Y1, Y2, y3 for until y12 for like an hour okay so what what is the assumption here so just in this context so what does iid mean maybe i should ask the question what does iid mean in this particular case so that means you can reduce each yi by each of those the rate of each event is going to be the same data so if it was like Right. So that's the okay, good. So IID itself, first of all, uh, independent, meaning that even though I'm standing at the same place, which is probably not a good assumption over there, but if we try to make this, like, try to put the model like this, we're saying that, okay, for the next hour, even if I break it, I'm standing at the same place, I break it into 12 different intervals with the same length, five minutes, I assume that, like, the number of people I, I will be able to count for each of the interval is independent from each other, which is probably not true, because it depends on where you are and in the time of the day as well. But still, if you put down a model like this, that's what you're doing and also so iid the first i is independent the other one is identical identical here meaning that each of this is having the same rate and each of this is Poisson. okay so i guess yeah so again i guess um it's always useful to think 
whether it makes sense to put a model like this a lot of times like okay like even though we know it's not perfect we can go ahead anyway um but i think people actually can be more flexible say if you're gonna if okay i don't believe it's gonna be the same theta and then maybe some people would do okay it's given theta one okay y2 is given theta two okay and yn is given theta n okay and something very powerful in the Bayesian analysis will be okay even though there are different thetas i think they're still related somehow but they're just not the same when you when the data arise like arise but i still believe they are related somehow so some people will actually put okay so say this gonna follow a poisson uh no sorry not poisson gamma right i will do a gamma over there mm -hmm. all right say like a b so what this is doing is i'm relaxing the constraint that i have instead of thinking about only one theta i think there will be multiple theta for each of the uh interval right but i still think the theta is somehow related and then i would try to make inference from there so good thing is this is more flexible right you have 12 thetas instead of one but at the same time it um i guess adds up the burden of estimating the model because now you have 11 more parameters that you have to estimate um but overall i was trying to say that bayesian model is flexible in the sense that okay i don't think my assumption makes sense so i'm gonna relax it a little bit and then there are still ways to do that and this in particular we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about is hierarchical bayesian modeling okay because you actually can put it into a hierarchy at the higher level that's how i observe the data at the lower level will be okay i assume different theta i so i have a lower level just for the theta itself anything else yes um so I Another thing I don't understand is mm -hmm. what's the difference between our 12 Ys and just one big Poisson distribution. Mm -hmm. They all have the same theta. Mm. Okay. What do you think, Becky? Or everybody, anybody else? So the question is, what's the difference? Okay, so here in the context, we're saying for the next hour, right? And what we're doing now is we break it into uh, 12 intervals, five minutes each. And we're assuming that each of them is the same Poisson theta. So what would be the difference between this and if I just have one big Y given theta and then gonna be a Poisson theta yeah, for, an hour. for an hour? What do you think? I mean, I don't know if I'm possessing the question mm -hmm. in the way you want, but are you asking like as a five, like having five minutes is equal to one hour? Well, for the purpose of our problem, why why would that be a different assumption to make than just one big? Because our n that we choose does matter. Um, yeah. So in the handout, I was just trying to provide a very generic case yeah. that if you have n different observations and if you make the assumption that they're iid, uh, you can derive. That's what it is, right? Yeah. However, if you look at it, of course, if you only have, so for the handout, if you only have one data point, like Y, then your posterior gamma will just be A plus Y, yeah. right? And your um, a posterior gamma is A plus Y and B plus one. Yeah. That will be the, I mean, in, in writing, that will be the difference, right? But if you asked this question, just saying that, say, okay, instead of looking, so what's the difference between these two models? I guess that's will be in the context, what, what the difference is what do you think that's my question yeah I don't, yeah I don't, I don't. Mm -hmm. becky what do you think or any other i can actually bring people back i think because i don't need that space anymore um. It's two different models, right? Yeah. And it's talking about two different things. I mean, there is no right or wrong. So the first one, I, my understanding will be the first one is, okay, my theta is actually rate for each five minutes. Yeah. And the second one, the rate will be for a whole hour. I mean, at least this are different. 
right? And for, I mean, I don't, yeah, so maybe like the, the toy example that we come up with, like, will show you like the, the big distinction anyway, but it's just, for this particular case, I think it's just two different situations that you're trying to model. Because for the first one, we'll just be okay, instead of looking at, instead of, um, yeah, the first one is, okay, I'm, so for both of this, I guess it's talking about next hour, right? Next 60 minutes. And the first one is, okay, I'm breaking it, I'm even counting it differently. I'm counting the first one, uh, for, like first y, like the yi, y1 is only for the first five minutes, y2 is for the second five minutes, et cetera, et cetera. While here, I'm counting it uh, just for a whole hour. I guess you can actually, so if, so that's actually an interesting question, because if you think about, if you think of this as experiment, if I collect data in this way, I can always change the question into this, right? If I already count y1, y2 until y12, then okay, in the end I say, okay, I'm not interested in five minutes anymore, I want you to for the whole hour. And then you can combine the data and then just do a different problem. That's definitely possible. But I guess it just depends on what you're trying to do. And this too, um, for the same context, breaking it and not breaking it represents two different questions. Make sense? Okay. I don't know if I... Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, if you, if I saw this, are we assuming that the first Poisson model, like the, with the 12 mm -hmm. observations, are we assuming that whole, um, um, all of those just are not ID, but the whole group of them is a Poisson data, is that what we're saying? The second one? The first one. Uh, it wouldn't make sense that the first one's. No, the second, sorry, the first one is IID. I forgot okay. to write it over so, there. Yeah, because you're breaking them. Mm -hmm. Why would the interval be both of those things? My question. Oh, yeah, so this is just two separate experiments. Okay. okay, sorry, yeah. It's just like, okay, I'm curious for the next hour. And Grant okay. may be interested, yeah, <laughs> interesting, like breaking to five minutes. And Becky may be only interesting the whole hour. And then, yeah, so just two different questions. But I think, I think, like, my guess is the question arises because back then for the beta binomial, we see one data point, right? And we're dealing with all that, just one data point. Uh, for the Poisson and for many other, I mean, even for beta, for beta, uh, for binomial, you can also have multiple data points. And I still want to estimate the same thing. So back then, uh, for the beta binomial, because it's the first time I've ever seen it, I just want to keep it simple. And now move to the Poisson and later, because you see a lot of like, a lot of problems to start with, okay, IID, whatever, with whatever, right? So you see that we're gonna see more and more of like producting the marginal to get the joint, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I guess it's maybe there is a jump over there between from the beta binomial to this gamma Poisson that maybe like you, like I didn't explain it well enough. So it's, it's maybe it's a jump over there. So you didn't get it. But I think, well, I think yeah, now it makes sense. The concerning mm -hmm. me was just yeah. that, because we had this extra plus N in there. It felt like we were pretending that we had 12 different experiments when we, I mean, maybe we did or maybe we didn't. Mm -hmm. It felt mm -hmm. like we were pretending we were more certain in the first case than the second case. What do you mean by more certain? Oh, I see. That's ah, that, good that, point. I, okay. I, feel like it, I see what you mean. Yeah, because that, okay, because again, like the sample size greatly changes, right? Yeah. So I think overall, like between these two, it's just two separate models to start with. So I wouldn't be like trying, like, be worried too much about in this particular um, context. But once we see more, I guess, applications, and then once you start doing the homework, I think you will see that, okay, usually you're gonna have multiple observations, and it will be very unlikely that, okay, I can actually just combine them into one and then do that same thing. It's just, I guess, I came up with a not so good context example uh, to start with, so that may uh, get people a little bit confused. Um, all right, anything else? And um, Julia, Cheryl, Lisa, Okay. okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, so I think we're going to end with this and then I will post it online. So with this, I think uh, homework too should be okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Okay. Any? <laughs>